Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. I'm Dan, once again alongside Matt, and we are 10% of the way into the season. Eight games have been played, and so far the Flames have a 5-3 and three record. I didn't think that's how we'd see this season start. How about you, Matt? Well, considering the last like 25 years of Flames hockey not being exactly stellar in terms of Octobers, the fact that they're off to a 5-3 and three start, especially with the con- competition they've had, it's fairly good. How often have we sat here in late March and April looking at how are we going to make up whatever number of points we need to get to the playoffs? And I'm hoping that coming out of the gate early, even when they do stumble for a bit, and we know it's going to happen, it happens to every team every year, they can build up kind of enough of a a lead that they can afford for that to happen. Well, two points in Game 1 matter just as much as two points in Game 82. So if they bank them early, you don't have to worry quite as much later on. Well, let's look at the three games the Flames played this week and how they did in these games. Um, On October 17th, the Flames played the Bruins here in Calgary. This was the China rematch. And I thought the Flames played a really good game. Some notable milestones here. Johnny Hockey got his 100th NHL goal, and Yusuf Valamaki got his first NHL goal. And we saw the return of last season's 3M line, who were the starting lineup for this game. That's uh, Froelich. Uh, Monahan, or sorry, Froelich, Kachuk, and Backlund, the 3M line. Overall, I thought in this one, the Flames, I think, came out to play harder. I don't necessarily think that they played the better game. I thought they came out harder. They played better hockey in the offensive zone, and the whole lineup was was kind of moving that puck around really well. After the first 20 minutes, we had 15 Flames who were plus one. I thought the big issue here for Boston was they were playing really sloppy in their own end, especially in the first and second. Um, Matt, what were your thoughts on this one? I thought the 3M line did an excellent job in containing the Marchand line. That's one of the best lines in hockey, and the fact that for the majority of the game, despite the only two Bruins goals coming from that line, they contained them fairly well, and like they were not a storyline throughout the game because each of the goals were kind of just happenstance plays materializing out of nothing frankly and like there was no sustained pressure from them and credit to those guys for playing an excellent defensive game and chipping in some goals well i was gonna say and they i mean fro leak himself who was scratched the game before got his second and third of the season two goals in this game I thought he was going to get a hat trick at one point. So good for them for being that offensive and defensive line. That I mean, we saw that last year, right? They were our defensive specialist line, but so many times we would see those guys chipping in offensively as well. Yeah, it's important for the Flames to have a line like that where, like, if you look realistically, if the Flames are going to be a playoff team, they're going to need to have guys like that that can go up against the other team's top tier talent and actually contain them as best as possible so that way Goudreau and all the rest of the guys can have fun and then in the first we saw Bill Peters make a successful coaching challenge on the one offside Boston goal which I think even after that one coaching challenge he already has a better record than Gully did yeah, I know. Uh, it's almost like the Jays, because uh, Gibbons uh, for the, the Jays would challenge everything and like constantly would have them overturned as well and not work. So it, it's nice to see that that worked, and hopefully we see a more judicious use of them so that way it's a higher level of success with the challenges. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. That's what happens with these kind of challenges. But it's nice to see, you know, that one especially, I think if Boston would have got that, that would have turned the tide on the Flames, just momentum-wise. Yeah, especially with them scoring the, their first goal shortly into the second period, that, that would have made it 3-2 at that point and would have made it a little more tough. But instead it was 3-1, Froelich scored his second, and pretty much put the nail in the coffin and credit here to Yusuf Valamaki who was playing in his eighth NHL game at, or not his eighth at this point is what fifth uh, NHL game and got his first goal so his goal comes from Stone and Jankowski and that's uh, great for any rookie to get his first goal but good to see Valamaki finally on the board 
Yeah, and he's doing well at on the defensive end of it. And it's nice to see that the Flames have three excellent young defensemen that are all playing well defensively. Yeah, it's we'll, we'll talk more about them as they go along. We talked a little bit about them last week, but I think that this team's going to have some hard decisions to make when Hammer comes back. Oh, for sure. Especially with the struggles of TJ Brody and Stone being okay i think you might see somebody one of the veterans sitting versus one of the kids just because of the fact that they played so well i think if nothing else though it lets them really take their time with hamannick oh for sure and especially with jaw injuries you don't want to rush that back just because frankly it would suck to (laughs) go through the whole regimen of like not being able to eat for all that time uh, other than through a straw and like just extremely uncomfortable so if he can have an extra few days where he can recover and get to closer to 100 percent, that'd be better for both him and the team in this boston game if you look at the tail of the tape things were actually pretty close shots on goal flames won at 29 to 26 Face-offs, the Flames lost 46-54. to um, Power plays, both teams are 0-4. Penalty minutes, both had 8. Both teams had 16 hits. Calgary had 15 blocks to Boston's 19. And giveaways, it was Boston 17 and Calgary 22. So the numbers are pretty close. But on the ice, I thought that Calgary looked like a, a more dominant team in this one. Well, you had a battle of two teams that should be in the top four or five in their conference so the fact that they're going punch for punch all night it makes sense and hopefully the flames can continue to win games like this where they're going up against good teams and getting two points speaking of going up against good teams and getting two points the next game the calgary flames took on the nashville predators at the zile dome and Calgary ended up losing that one 5-3. to three. Uh, Calgary goals from Lindholm is fifth of the year. Kachuk is third. Bennett his second. And those were the Calgary goal scorers. I thought really for me, um, two things that stood out for me. I thought that the Bennett-Ryan-Neal line really came into its own in this game and was the best line of the game um, as I far agree. as two-way play. I and agree. I thought this might have been the best Sam Bennett game I can ever remember. Yeah, he's really coming into his own, and I'm hoping that he continues to play well because with each game, he'll get more confidence in himself and hopefully start translating that into actual success instead of just a short hot streak and then disappearing again or something. And on the Nashville side, credit to UC Saros, who came in uh, late in the game for an injured Pekka Rene. I thought, usually you see this, that when you know the starter goes out mid-game, the backup comes in, the other team can light him up. And I thought, well, there's the Flames' chance to get ahead. So good for Saros for holding down that net. Yeah, it's unfortunate that Rene did leave the net. I, honestly, I think if the Flames continued with Rene in net, I think the Flames win this game. I just, Saros won them the game, frankly. And... Mike Smith, on the other hand, cost the Flames two points. That yeah. goal by Ronaldo was... that Goaltending 101. If the defender has the pass covered, take the shooter. Not, you know, be halfway in between and allow the guy to score. I hate to say it, anytime you're getting scored on by Zach Ronaldo, something's wrong. True. Like, you know, that'd be like McGratton or Christoph Oliwa scoring. It's like, um... Okay. <laughs> and of course, Ronaldo's first of the year. Uh, maybe his I only think of that the year. I think that might be the only thing that you see from him offensively for the rest of the year. He might get an assist or two. We'll see. So, not a great game there overall, but something I think in this one I could see things definitely and we and we keep hearing Peters, you know, talking about things they have to work on. There's definitely some things they had to work on here. And I thought it was a good learning game for this team. Yeah, and if you look at Nashville, they're currently the top team in the league. The only loss they had was to us. And despite Smith being not very good in this game, we were going punch for punch with them. It was 3-3 halfway through the third period. Like 
it was just unfortunate that the Ronaldo goal happened and then the empty netter. But, you know, considering that Nashville is as good of a team as they are and they were in it right through till the end, that's a credit to the Flames. Even though they did not get two points, they're showing that they're able to skate with teams like that and play well and they didn't have their best game but they showed a lot of resilience bouncing back from trailing a couple of times to at least tie the game it didn't carry on to get the two points but still there are positives well i said this in our predictions last week too that after you know blanking the preds three nothing they were going to come out hard and looking for revenge and that's exactly what we saw yeah and frankly getting two points out of those two games for me is a win because you know you have two games against the be- two of the best teams in the league splitting it hey awesome now go go beat up the losers and get a couple of points from the rangers yeah well and that's what the team did they went back on the road went to broadway and for the first time since 2008 won in madison square garden uh david riddick was in net for this one and made a career high 44 saves. And all the flame scoring comes from two players. One likely suspect, Goudreau, who gets his fourth and fifth of the year. And Matt's boy, Garnet Hathaway, who gets his first and second of the year. Well, that goal, the first one for Hathaway, was just vintage AHL scorer, Garnet Hathaway. He starts the play by smashing a Ranger in the corner, knocking the puck off his stick creating all sorts of havoc that leads to turnovers which leads to Jankowski getting open and Hathaway skates to the net wide open for the tap-in it's a, if you've watched Stockton games when Hathaway first came aboard that you've seen that about eight or nine ten times now so it's fairly common for him it it's just that it's nice to see him playing like that in the NHL which we didn't really see under Gullitson. It's kind of weird for you to say vintage when this kid's 26. It's not like we're talking about a Yermer Yager or something like that. Well, been talking about him for a few years now, so got a little bit of a book on him. So hopefully that'll make Hathaway come alive there. Uh, his first goal assisted by Jankowski, the second one unassisted. But I thought in this game, um, really, I think Riddich stepped up and bailed the team out a number of times. There was a lot of times I think the goalie really kept the Flames in this one. And also a really good game for Rasmus Anderson, maybe his best we've seen this season. Um, and thirdly, my thought was uh, the Dubé-Jankowski-Hathaway line. Again, they got two goals, but looking really good in that game. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to feel like we've got our four lines established now. Yeah, and I think you might see Zarnik sitting out for a little while longer until somebody clearly starts to struggle enough where they need a time a game off. Because all four of those lines are rolling fairly effectively, and not so much with the defense pairings, though. Yeah, well, why don't we talk about that? So the lines as they sit right now... Um... The first line, Johnny Goudreau, Sean Monahan, Elias Lindstrom. A lot of people thought Lindstrom would be on Lindstrom would be on that or sorry, Lindholm would be on that line in the off season. And I was one of the people that said, Well, no, I think Neil will be there, but Lindholm's looking better. Um thoughts on that first line, Matt? Well, frankly, the fl- Monahan and Goudreau just needed somebody with some skill to play with and who could both make a pass and receive a pass. And I think that, like, Furlan could receive a pass and take a shot, but he wasn't really a good playmaker. So, like, if he had a puck, you, you're you not really too worried other than for the shot. But with Lindholm, you have somebody who can create plays by himself, and that makes that line even more dangerous. Yeah, I think Lindholm really gives them the playmaker they need as well. I think both Monaghan and Goudreau want to be the the sniper, want to be the you know man that puts it home. And with the three of them, they can all set each other up. I think that makes for a really dangerous top three. Oh, for sure. And I think that that will be one of the highest scoring lines in the entire NHL this season. The next line, I guess what's old is new again. We go back to what worked last year with the 3M line of Matthew Kachuk, Michael Backlund, and Michael Froelich. We saw Froelich sitting as a healthy scratch, and now on, let's just call it the second line, 
Um, probably no new thoughts on that line, but I think this line, as we saw in Boston, can be both an offensive threat and a great shutdown line. So I'm hoping that the coach will keep these guys around. Yeah, it, it, if it works, why mess with a good thing? It, you know, it's been one of the top defensive lines for the last few seasons since Kachuk came in the league. Why not keep it on? I mean, good to try new things, which I'm glad the coach did, but sometimes you've got to realize that you had gold with what you know we we're already playing. The next line is one that's fairly new. We talked about them earlier, the line of Sam Bennett on the left, Derek Ryan down the middle, and James Neal on the right. I think this is a big reason why we're seeing Sam Bennett be successful. He's on a line with two veterans and two guys that I think really gel with his style. It's letting Sam Bennett do his thing. Derek Ryan's not a big you know, um, offensive threat. I think James Neal definitely can be, and G- James Neal's the finisher. I think Bennett can be the setup man for Neal. Uh, I think that you'll start seeing Neal and Bennett feeding each other a lot more with Ryan basically being the guy who wins the faceoffs and can make plays, but you're not relying on him. I can see Ryan being a little bit more like an earlier Matt Stajan where he's a good you know, two-way forward there. He's a little bit more defensively responsible because the other two aren't going to be and don't need to be. Exactly. I agree. And then the third line we're seeing that looked really good in that New York line is, uh, or on that New York game is Dylan Dubé, Mark Jankowski, and Garnett Hathaway. And I think here Dubé and Jankowski are the key pieces. I think you could see Hathaway swapped out for Zarnik, but... I think you're right. Leave this line alone for now and see what they can do. Yeah, uh, you got a nice blend of everything. Hathaway can engage physically. Dubé is a bit of an all-over player, and Jankowski is a responsible two-way guy. So you got a little bit of everything, and hopefully that continues to work. If not, parts will be swapped out for Zarnik or Beluso, maybe. And then on the back end, and we'll talk a little bit about more of these guys later, but just so everyone kind of sees where we're at right now, we have Gio and Brody as our first pair, Hannafin and Anderson as the second pair, and Valimaki Stone as the third pair, with Dalton Prout as the extra extra defenseman. Um, We'll talk a little bit more, especially about the pairings in a little bit, so let's not get into those now, but... Interesting, I think, to see that Hannafin and Anderson are the second pair. Like That's quite a bit of confidence in the young rookie who didn't even make the team out of camp. Well, he's played well. It's one of those situations where he's earned the minutes and the coach is saying, well, hey, you're doing well. Let's see what you got. And he was given an opportunity to be on the first line with Giordano in the New York Ranger game. And frankly, if the Brody struggles continue i wouldn't be shocked in the montreal game next on uh, tomorrow that the flames will go back to that just to see if anderson can hold those minutes and play effectively let's let's talk before we get into some flames that are struggling let's talk about a guy who's been really good that i don't think anyone expected and that's our backup goalie dave david riddick riddick has looked i thought good in both of his two starts and he's had three total games in net you know me, Matt. I was expecting at the beginning of the year Riddick was going to struggle, and I was expecting that we would have a bit of a struggle with him anytime we had to put him in based on what we saw last year. But to me, Riddick's really rising the occasion. Um, we saw in that New York game he played great. He could bail the team out. I'm not saying he could do that 60 times a year, but that's what you need from a backup, that when you put him in the net, he can rise to the occasion. What are your thoughts on Riddick? Well, this is what I was meaning last week when I made that movie reference, where I was seeing a little bit there, and he seemed like a very confident player in his own game. And a goalie that's not confident does not play like that against the New York Rangers. If he was unsure of himself at all, I think the Rangers actually win that game. So... The fact that he is that confident, he made a handful of saves that were top-notch, especially on that scrambly play early in the third period. And he has looked extremely good in the appearances that he's made. And that was part of the reason why last week I was saying that I'd like to see a little more of him, just because he was showing those little flashes of being decent and 
while I don't think that he'll eventually take over as being the starter, it might be a decent option to have him and Smith basically being a 1A, 1B, where, like, say Smith's getting, like, 50 games and Riddick's getting, like, 30-ish. I think going into the season, you know me, I wanted to bring in a veteran goalie because I didn't have faith in Riddick, and I think the way he's playing... Not only is he confident, but more importantly, this team's confident playing in front of him, and that's something we don't often see with Flames backup goalies. I think if I was the coach right now, I don't know if I'd look at it as a 1A, 1B, but I think for Riddick, I'd say you play till you lose. Not necessarily for Smith, but I think for Riddick, it's okay. You won, we'll play again, we'll play until you lose, and then we'll reevaluate. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like Smith will be getting the start tomorrow, so that won't happen, but... Well, hopefully, fortunately, but you know what I mean. Like uh, With Riddick, I'd like to see him play a little bit more, but I know that with the current schedule coming up after Montreal, we play, I think, Pittsburgh, Washington, and Toronto. And then Buffalo. So, yeah, so like I'm kind of already penciling Riddick into the Buffalo game, and I think that you'll see Smith for the next four. Yeah, and, you know, you should see Smith. I mean, he's the starter, right? He should be starting the majority of the games. What I like, though, is that three weeks into the season, we've had Riddick in that twice already for a start, and I think that it, the more that he's confident, the more this team's going to put him in there, which, I mean, one of the things you and I both said we were worried about was the fragility of Smith. So I think that the more Riddick plays well, the more he's going to earn that net. Exactly, if he wins most of his games, then how can you keep him on the bench? Exactly. Well, Matt, great things happening for the Flames. We're all excited. The 5-3 record, but there's some Flames that have been struggling. And I don't know about you, I've been trying to identify some things here. Not that I want to be a downer, but some guys that I think we need to talk about here who maybe aren't where they need to be. So I've identified four. I don't know if there's anyone you want to talk about, but I'll jump in on these guys and you can tell me your thoughts. First one being the man we just talked about, Mike Smith. I thought for a starter of a team that is supposed to be a playoff team, he's not looked as good as he should. I think he's looked bad in four of six total games, and I think he's probably cost the Flames two wins right now. David Riddick, on the other hand, has been great, but he's not someone we can bet on for 60 games. So I'm not really sure what to make of Smitty. Do you think this is just one of those things where is he already shown his age with the China trip and a lot of preseason hockey? Do we just need to wait for him to come around? Or does Tree need to go out and make a move to get somebody more reliable? I think that what you'll end up seeing is it, can Smith work it out? And if Smith is, say, playing like this by like the end of November – then I think you see Riddick taking over the starting job fully, and then we're on the market for a goalie. But Smith has been a fairly consistently good goaltender for most of his career. So he does go through, like, I know that, like, Coyotes fans were saying before we acquired him that he goes through stretches where he's not good at all, and then others where he's basically god on ice and we're seeing one of the bad stretches for him and if he snaps out of it then there's not a problem you just unfortunately when it comes to goalies you kind of just have to wait and see and it hasn't really been that big of a deal because of the fact that the Flames are still like in the top seven in the NHL but you can't and, expect that to keep going for 70 more games no, and that's where, like, if he doesn't start making progress, then I think you'll start seeing Riddick getting more and more starts and maybe even starting against some good teams, uh, not just some of the lesser opponents, and seeing how things go. Because, it, frankly, like, if Smith is, like, only being good for one out of every three games, like, you just simply can't have that. And... If it wasn't for the fact that the Flames are basically second in the NHL in goals, then I think that we're probably you could reverse the where we are in this uh, in terms of wins and losses. So it it's one of those things where it's a concern, but 
you have to be a little patient and it's probably another month worth of seeing how each of the goalies plays and you know i don't know enough about smitty i mean he seems very driven very you know eager very intense maybe what you gotta do is like you said give riddick the jobs and tell smitty earn your spot back Oh, it's sort of like uh, a couple years ago when Elliot and Johnson were our two st- goalies, and like Johnson just was playing on his head, standing on his head for like the entire month of November, and ended up stealing the job from Elliot, who similarly struggled out of the gate, and has never recovered. Yeah, well, Elliot did play a little better for more of the season after that, but. Then was horrible in the playoffs, and yeah, he's in fl- uh, with the Flyers now, so it's not our problem. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those situations that hopefully Smith can recover and start playing well, and if Riddick keeps playing good, then give him more ice time. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that, you know, we can't... We can't keep playing Smitty if Smitty's not playing well just because he's 36 or because he's penciled in as the starter. And I think he'll come around for sure. I mean, you know, we have an unprecedented start. Somebody's got to start kind of slow. And I think Smitty will come around to playing the way he needs to, even if that means resting him for a bit, um, putting Riddick in and then getting him back in the net. And you also, to be fair to Smith, like he's faced a handful of extremely good teams. And, you know, like St. Louis and Nashville, who lit him up, like those are two of the best offenses in the NHL. So while, you know, the Vancouver game was not good, it's one of those situations where, you know, yeah, you wish he was better, but you also have to factor in the competition as well. Well, and the other thing, too, if you look at the season, I mean, they've played a lot of hockey so far. If we go back to the second week of the season, they played every other day, the 9th, the 11th, the 13th. Then they got a three-day break. They played the 17th, the 19th, the 21st. Now they're playing the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, the 29th, and 30th. So pretty much every other day they've been playing, and maybe it's just taking this toll on Smitty. I mean, maybe we just need to get Riddick a couple more starts and, you know, let Smitty sit for a bit. It's weird to be playing that every other. Usually you and I are talking about this in like February or March that we've got the every other schedule. Uh Uh-huh. Not early on. Well, it's also been a very tough start for the Flames in terms of the quality of competition. So it's been more like a March than, frankly, a October. So Get it out of the way. Exactly, because I think like for the next handful of months afterwards, like the quality of competition is nowhere near as consistently good. Yeah, we can look through the schedule a bit later. I was just flipping to November, and we get some I think lower quality teams there. Uh, December, eh, not bad, but also the Flames have been on the road a lot this this month with combined with the China trip. I think maybe they just need some home cooking. Yeah, true enough. The next guy I'm a little concerned about, and I've heard other people as well, is are we concerned James Neal is, let's call it, on the third line right now? Um, He's ending up on that line that we talked about earlier with Ryan and Sam Bennett. Are we worried that we're, you know, paying one of our top forwards to be on the third line? Is this going to be the next Troy Brower or Stajan? We go love the player uh, in Stajan's case, but not the contract. Or is it going to be like Brower where we're waiting for this guy to be bought out by the end? Or do you think this is right where he should be and, not, and we're not too worried about the salary cap? Uh, frankly, if it wasn't for Lindholm having an insane chemistry with Gaudreau and Monaghan, I think that Neil would have already been on the first line. And Neil is basically playing how Neil plays. He plays with a bit of an edge and... He chips in offensively here and there. It's one of those things that, because he's a big name, that I think people expected more of him. And, like, if you look when he was with Nashville and when he was with the Golden Knights, he was not on the first line most of the time. And the fact of the matter is is that he's just a good goal scorer who can play with a bit of a nasty edge. And... Him being on the third line, with the 3M line being what it is, you can't really 
shoehorn Neil in there. Well, you could, but it might disrupt a little bit of the defensive chemistry. So there's not really anywhere else then for him to be on the third line. And yeah, you don't want to spend $5 million plus on a third line player, but he's not... Calgary's in a situation where like their third line, frankly, is better than most teams' second line. So it's one of those odd situations, and he's just not getting... He's a little bit out of sorts as well because he's been to the Stanley Cup Finals two years in a row. A lot of hockey. So him struggling right now, it's like, yeah, okay. Is it a big deal? Eh, not really. If this continues like through January, then yeah, sure. Then there will be some concern. But for now, eh, just wait and see. My thoughts on number 18 is I sort of agree with what you're saying about Lindholm. I think that Neil was, by most people, penciled into B line two, and you can't fault the 3M line for stealing that, which is awesome. I think that we're really going to see Calgary sort of have two offensive and two defensive lines. I think we're going to see the Neil line and the uh, Goudreau line as the offensive lines, and then the 3M line and whatever iteration the fourth line is is sort of our shutdown line. So, with that in mind, I think Neil will definitely see get some more offensive production than he has now that he's sort of settled out and has some line mates and can play with those guys. But if nothing else, we're seeing Neil make uh, Sam Bennett more productive. And I think that alone, which we haven't found somebody who could do that, even Yager couldn't really do that, is going to be worth it. Where I think people aren't giving Neil credit is this is a long season. Injuries happen. And I don't know about you, I would feel much more confident having Neil jump in on line one or two than I would say a Bennett or a Jankowski or a Zarnik. So I think that even though we might be playing on line three right now, Neil's sort of our insurance policy come January, February, March. Well, look at last season for a perfect example. We go in with the lineup that, that should have been good enough to be a playoff team. And then pretty much straight off, two of our four right wingers get hurt and we have nobody to replace them. And there goes their season right there. So the fact that we have a guy like Neil on a depth line, as you said, injuries happen. You can slot him up, at, and he'd be perfectly fine on the first line, the second line, or the third line. So it is what it is, and it's one of the hallmarks of being one of the better teams in the league is that you have a lot of depth, and that means good players are playing on the third line. Well, any team that goes deep in the playoffs always has that one depth guy that comes alive, and I think for the Flames, Neil could be one of those, huh, I didn't think it would be him guys in the playoffs. Exactly. So, I'm not too concerned. I mean, it is a $5.75 million deal, the third highest forward deal on the team, and he's signed for six years, I think, by the end. Yeah, it might not be a great deal when he's 36, but for right now, we can afford it. Um, I think you definitely hold on to him for nothing else than that depth. And maybe when Seattle comes in, you expose him, but that's a ways down the line, I think, at least for this year. There's no complaints with where he's at and what he's going to do. And like I said, if he can if he can bring Bennett alive, all the, all the better. Exactly. The next guy I'm worried about is a guy who was pretty promising for the Flames, and that's Mark Jankowski. And last year we saw Janko get brought up during the – uh, during an injury, he really forced his way into the team. And I'm starting to wonder, and I hate to say it, but is he's headed for extra forward territory for almost being that number 13 forward. If you look, his roles from last year have really been filled by other people. He and Bennett didn't have the chemistry everyone wanted him to, and now that's James Neal's job playing with Bennett. Yeah, we're seeing Jankowski on that fourth line, but I don't think he's necessarily the big piece there. The Flames have added some PK options with Lindholm and Ryan. I I mean, it's a good thing for the team to be this deep, but I'm just wondering if we're starting to see Mark Jankowski maybe really settle where he should be, and that might be your sort of 13th forward. Well, with Jankowski, he, he's, he needs to get more assertive on the ice and use his body more. And... Frankly, he plays too much of a passive game, almost like Joel Colborne, and he's somewhat, at times, easier to push off the puck. He is decent defensively, so like I don't think he's going to be an extra forward for very much if 
you know, he does become that. But he has the potential to be more than what he is. And he's struggling currently to find his way. And hopefully he can get some more intensity in his game. Otherwise, he's looking like he might slide backwards a bit, unfortunately. I mean, just looking at some of the guys that we have as 13 forwards and looking at some of the AHL prospects that might come up next year, Janko's making 1.6, which is not too bad, and 1.7 the year after. I think, you know, he's going to be a guy who's always going to have an NHL job. I just don't know that, like you said, unless he sort of changes his style of play. He still looks like a college player out there in a lot of ways to me. He's easy to push off the puck. He's not that physical. Um, I think that he's going to struggle to hold down a regular roster spot. And the fact that he's at, as big of a player as he is, he could turn into a real beast of a player if he learned how to play that way and like you know if i'm the coach i'm telling kachuk to go over to him and show him how to use his physical body to shelter you know because we saw a couple of times during the rangers game that kachuk was using his body to maintain control of the puck effectively and that was one of the things that we haven't seen much from Jankowski this year. So it's one of those things where he needs to change his game a bit, but there's still enough there where he could be a top-notch forward. It's just he's, frankly, just struggling. I think looking at the depth this team has now and the long-term depth, I think he's destined to be a top-six guy for a while. Um you know, he's 24, I think, to at least like 26, 27. If he stays in Calgary, he's going to be a a bottom six guy. And, I mean, I don't want to say they should do this, but he's a piece that I could see the team parting with if they need something to move. I agree. I think that there's still value in him. I don't think there's a ton of value, but, you know, he's a young forward. He's uh, 24, six foot four. There's always that value there. And if he is playing on the fourth line... I mean, you know, I guess the question becomes, is there somebody on the farm who could do that better? And I think we'd be silly to say there's not. True. And it's one of those situations where, like, if you look at uh, Dallas, uh, when they traded for Jason Spezza, the the players that they sent to Ottawa, guys like Jankowski were two of the players that they sent. And Mm -hmm. just decent guys you know with upside they didn't of course pan out with ottawa but you know the attempt was there and i think that the flames could parlay jankowski and possibly some other pieces into another top player well and that and that might be part of what you got to give up if we need to go goalie shopping yeah and that's entirely possible and even, I mean, I think, honestly, until probably Christmas, we're going to see Jankowski and Zarnik battling for that spot on the fourth line. But so far, I'm seeing Zarnik putting it together more than Jankowski, and I think he might end up winning that job for that reason. Well, and we just have to wait and see. And the last guy on this list I want to talk about, somebody on the other side, on the blue line, and I think we all know who we're going to talk about, number seven, TJ Brody. We had some concerns last year. I remember at the end of the season, both of you thinking, you know, if the Flames are going to move a piece, maybe it's Brody. Obviously, they went a different way with Hamilton. But um, I was excited at the beginning of the season when we heard Brody and Gio were going to play well together or we're going to play together again because they've always played well together. But I don't know. We're seeing Brody We're seeing Brody make some really dumb mistakes and not finish what he should be. And I'm just – I'm really concerned about TJ Brody as one of our – I guess, top two guys right now. So, Matt, let me ask you this question. Do you think that by, let's say, the middle of November, Brody loses his spot on the number one pairing? And if so, to who? Both of us kind of suspected, because Brody got thrown on the left side, that that was the be-all reason of why he was struggling. Which, you know, makes sense because of the fact that it's completely different from how he's used to playing in... He just didn't seem to fit that way. And could have been one of many issues. Yeah, but 
and frankly, he did play well for the first handful of games when he was put back with Giordano. But the last four or five games, he's been really noticeably bad. And that's not helpful. And at this point, I don't see another option where it makes sense to for him to be bumped down in the lineup. Because uh, like, if you look at the right side defenders, you have Stone, you have Brody, and then you have uh, Hamannick and Anderson. Well... Hamnick's out, of course, but you're not going to put Stone on the first pairing. And I don't want to put a rookie uh, up there. Yeah, like, I like Rasmus Anderson, don't get me wrong, and I think he could be a high-quality top-four defenseman, but do you want to see him 24 minutes a night when he's a rookie? Like, he could probably do it, but... I think that's one of those things we reserve for w- when we have a game where someone's hurt, and we've you know got to try new things. Yeah, like, would you be comfortable with that? And frankly, not really. Mm-hmm. But if Brody continues to be having performances like the last handful of games, then maybe you might have to look at it, even though it sounds ridiculous of having Anderson on the first pairing. So here's my thought. We've got a coach who knows one of these defensemen much better than the other because they came over here from Carolina together, and that's Noah Hannafin. To me, Hannafin, not now, but he is the heir apparent to the number one pairing. He's 21. We got him locked up long term. Does the coach try him on a pairing with Gio? Uh, I think that because of the left-right split, that because Giordano and Hannafin are both lefty defensemen, I would assume that that would not happen, but you could definitely try it. I think that Hannafin would be is just fine though where he is, and I actually wouldn't even be opposed to a Hannafin Brody pairing and Anderson with Giordano for the time being. The nice thing I think it, if if we're gonna move a rookie up against Gio, Gio's good at making guys look good and protecting his partner, and I think that that I don't think it would work long term, but it might be enough just to get those guys ignited. Yeah, and plus it's uh kicking the butt to Brody frankly Mm -hmm. of hey you know we got rid of Hamilton we need you to step up and play yeah and you know you're not playing so we're gonna put a kid in who's got like 15 games or whatever Anderson played you know in in your spot and you're gonna play less minutes and hopefully that ignites something in Brody where he resumes playing well if not, then, you know, the Flames are going to be scrambling a bit. And frankly, at this point, Brody would be the player I'd expose in, a, in an expansion draft, but that's... That's at least a year away. Yeah. I like your idea of Hannafin Brody. I think that pairing could work. I'd also be willing to send Brody down to the third pair with Valimaki and move Stone up. Um, I think that, you know, even Michael Stone, Stone's made a lot of mistakes. I think he's playing like Brody. Um, I just think he's not as, as talked about, but I'm thinking if you have Anderson on the first pair, Hannafin and Stone and Valimaki Brody, you're no better off than I think you could swap Brody and Stone interchangeably with Hannafin. Yeah. But I also don't want to stop Hannafin. That's my word. I know. Yeah, I know. It's kind of tough right now. It's bad when, like, other than Giordano, your three best defensemen are, like, 21, 20, and 20. You know. <laughs> and I think if we had, um, if we had um, the guy who's out right now, Travis Hamanick in, I think the obvious choice would be Giordano Hamanick, Hannafin Brody. Um, and maybe they'll try that when he comes back, but... I've never been a I've never been a believer that Brody was a top two. I thought he was a top two in Calgary because we were short on good defensemen for a while, and he looked great with Gio. He's sort of like the three M line. We've seen those guys just don't look as good uh, apart. But I think Brody, honestly, his upside is a four five. I think that Brody was basically to uh, while we had him on the first pairing was more like what Chalmerson was to Chicago when they had Keith and Seabrook as being the top pairing. And where, like, a good number three, and I think that when Brody was good, he was a good number three. We only had Giordano at the time, but 
you know, so he was kind of forced into being the number two. But, you know, like right now, he's more of a four or five, as you said. And, you know, it, he needs to play better. And, like, it's fine if he's a number three again. Yeah, good it's contract. Just... I mean, you know, he's a younger defenseman still. I think he's a fine number three, 28 years old, 4.8 million uh, this year, 4.6 against the cap. Fine to be a number three, but I think that this team needs to realize his number three and then ask, well, who's number two? And that's, you know, where, like, the Flames are going to have to do one of two things, and that's uh, spend a lot at, like, uh, what San Jose did to get Carlson, but, you know, find, like, a legitimate top-pairing defenseman and trade for them. Or basically hope that one of the three kids can do it. And my issue with trading right now is what do you want to give up? Yeah, and that's the problem because you're probably looking at Bennett Plus. And I'd, yeah. be, I'd be more likely to go shopping on July 1st than I would to trade for a premier defenseman. Yeah, same here. So I, I'm not saying Brody should be out of lineup or anything. I think he's still a serviceable NHL defenseman. I think he just needs a partner who can, I don't want to say protect him, but work with his flaws a bit. And I think Hammond or Hannafin Brody, definitely worth a shot. And maybe it is a reward. Maybe it's, hey, Anderson, you know, you move from being on the farm to being on the second line, now up to the first line. I don't see any reason why Geo Anderson couldn't work. I don't really want to see a rookie there, but... You know, I think Geo can take the brunt of that work, and if we've got a veteran sort of, you know, veteran second pairing with Brody Hannafin, I think that could actually be quite a good pairing. I just worry that it might stifle Hannafin a bit. Yeah. It's... We're in an interesting territory with the Flames where, like, frankly, all of the four young defensemen that we have, including Shillington on the farm... Like, they all need, like, another year or two to mature. and But, you know, all three of the ones that are in the NHL are doing a great job. It's just... Uh, well, and it's just hard when you got, you're got you relying on very inexperienced players for key positions. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have Hamannick back soon, and that's going to help sort things out. But even then, we're one too many defensemen. And I honestly would not be surprised if we see the Flames make a move there, even if flipping somebody for some draft picks or something like that. But I don't think at this point you can say to Raz, back down to, especially if they move him up with Giordano, you can't go, well, back to Stockton with you. There's nothing for him to no, gain there. No, I think, honestly, I think that you'll see either Stone or Brody sitting for a bit. See, I think, I think just because we need some right-handed defensemen in Stockton, I think Dalton Proud will go down. And you'll see Stone. Yeah, I agree. And I think Stone becomes the extra defenseman or Brody, like you said, sit him for a couple of games, see what happens. Yeah, and that's one of the good things with the coaching staff is that they've been more than willing to park people on the bench if they're not playing well. Any other flames you're concerned about that you want to talk about? Uh, um, not really. Like the guys that are doing just okay like say stone Our well guys we you're not really okay. expect yeah like okay yeah he's not very good but you know you're not really expecting him to be all that and then some so yes and no not really though uh, like everybody that is kind of doing meh overall you're kind of expecting them to do that so I feel like we've now figured out, at least on the forward side, we have our four lines established. We're mixing guys up a lot, and I feel like now that we have our four lines established, some of these guys, like maybe Orion or Hathaway, we're going to see some more consistency from them because they now have their line mates. And same thing on the blue line. I think maybe with a little bit of minor shuffling, we pretty much have our pairs. So I'm expecting things to start clicking now. I'm hoping so, and especially like after the three games against the very good Eastern Conference clubs, the Flames kind of go into a stretch where they're not playing a, a ton of high-talent teams, so hopefully they can carry on and play well beyond that and st 
continue to put up a lot of points. And we've got the forwards locked up. Maybe now it's time to start shuffling those defensemen like we were talking about. Yep. Well, Matt, we had a question this week. We put out, as we always do, a question on Twitter asking, what do you guys want us to talk about? Is there anything you guys want to know or want our thoughts on? And this week, a friend of the show submitted a couple of questions in the past. Ryan, who goes by at 76 Swanson on Twitter, asked us about next year's goaltending and what UFAs this team should target. So I'm assuming Ryan is assuming that uh, Smitty's not coming back. A fair assumption, I think. He's 36. Um, let's let's run this down in a couple ways, Matt. First off, if Smitty comes back, do you think that he gets starter money? Or I think if he's going to come back, he's got to take less than three, and he becomes a 1B. What do you think? Uh, it depends on how he plays, frankly, the rest of the year. If he plays basically at his career average, then, like, say, a one- or two-year deal at, like, three and a half, four million I would be two, fine. I don't want to do two. That puts him to 38. I know. Uh, this yeah, he's not the dominator. I don't want him playing until he's like forty. Yeah, I think just age wise, he can't be a number one next year. You don't want to go into a season with your starting goalie mm. at thirty seven. I think if he's coming back, he's got to take a big pay cut, and he becomes your one B. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there. Um, but let- yeah, yeah, that's not. I frankly, I don't see the Flames and Smith being together next season at all well let me run down a couple scenarios i've thought of here so if smith comes back and let's say he is that 1b for one year i think you can bring in a different type of goalie i think if smitty comes back and he's in that spot you could get a lesser known goalie i could see the team going for somebody like a michael newverth or robin leonard or even a peter morazic to be the other guy the 1b or even a keith kincaid uh, as a goalie to be that one B because then you know you've got two you know guys who between the two of them will figure it out yeah I'd actually uh, speaking of Kincaid I'd actually rather go for Corey Schneider really uh, I know that would be Another a trade man well he's only 32 okay it's not like he's ancient or no, anything I guess that's true uh he's been kind of outplayed by Kincaid but yeah, it's one of those situations where, like, all of the options have their warts. Like, Varlamov is good in stretches. Bobrovsky is good, but he's going to get paid. Bobrovsky's <laughs> going to get paid, and I don't want the Flames. I mean, they've got a big deal in Kachuk they got to make. I don't want to pay whatever it's going to take to get Bobrovsky, which I think is going to be upwards of nine. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking like 8-5 at the least. Pecorino, we'll, like again, a, I, I think he's 35. I think he'll get a one or two year, another big deal there. Yeah, he's probably a 7-7.5. Seven, seven uh, you could trade for Carey Price, maybe, but that term on that contract, it's a bear. So, you know, like there are options, but they all kind of suck in their own individual unique ways. Like either they're they're going to cost way too much to acquire too many dollars, too many years, or they just start. Well, I think that's why good. Ryan here is talking about UFA signings, um, assuming yeah. that we're not going to go that way. Let me throw out some names here and see what you think. Uh, what if we were to go with the guy that our friends up north are going with and bring in Cam Talbot? That would be hilarious. I, I, I actually wouldn't mind that, frankly. And that would be funny for two reasons. Like, if the Flames ended up winning the cup with Cam Talbot, that would just be, you know, icing on the cake. Well, I mean, but the whole thing I, was every time a goalie left Edmonton, look at, you know, Dubnik and all these guys, they got significantly better. Maybe Talbot's... Well, even team. Brossois is playing very good in Winnipeg now. So, you know, I, I frankly, I think that... If the Flames went for Talbot, that'd be perfectly fine. Uh, I don't. I, I think that him and McDavid are the only two high quality players on the Oilers. So Talbot's thirty. You, know, you could lock him up to a two three year deal and have Riddick behind him. Yeah, exactly. And like when Talbot's on his game, he's probably the single best goaltender in the NHL. So it's just that you know when you're playing in front of a team where it's basically McDavid and an AHL team you're kind of going to have a hard time. What about Cam Ward, 34? Uh, I could see... If one of the young goalies, like, say Riddick 
establishes himself as being a potential starter, then Cam Ward is a backup, sure. Fine. I was about to say, I think Cam Ward would look like a really nice backup to, and I'm not saying he's ready next year, but to a Tyler Parsons, that young upcomer who, you know, you must have uh, a guy to bail him out. And I think Cam Ward is making $3 million. I think he'll make less than that next year. Yeah. Yeah, he'd be that, a great he'd backup. be perfectly. F- yeah, he'd be fine as a backup. What about Michael Newverth? Out of Philly, I've never, I've never really liked him, and he, again, he tends to give I up. See him be, coming in as a quality backup. Yeah, he tends to give up really dumb goals uh, f- at random occasions, and it's like uh, you just killed the team. Thanks, awesome, mm-hmm. and. You know, he's a good goalie most of the time, and then he'll give up this real stinker of a goal, and it just derails the team. So, (laughs) you know, I'm reticent just because of that, but he's decent overall. It's just those uh, frequent stinkers would be extremely frustrating. Two names I'm going to throw out there that I can see the Flames going after because of their age. One I mentioned earlier, Peter Mrazek. I think Mrazek could be that guy who is the next backup to kind of go starter, if you know what I mean? Like, I think he's one of the better backups. He's 26. I don't think he's played in He's played in front of really great teams. And I think if you were to go with him and Riddick, it could be a pretty good pairing. He's making 1.5 now. Even if you double what he's making at 26, he's still got a young goaltender who's got some future. Yeah. Mrazek's problem is basically that he thinks he's better than he is. And his ego kind of got in the way when he was with Detroit. And, like, he basically felt that he was better than Howard when he wasn't really. And I think part and, of that's coaching, too. Yeah. So. All right. What about Robin Leonard? Well, actually, I'll combine the two because they kind of both have the same attitude issues. If you can get them to work correctly, they could become top tier starters. It's just the they're a head case, and can you actually get them to, you know, it's like trying to settle the ADHD kid in class. Like, and see, it, you know, I don't know we need either one of them to be a top-tier starter. I think if Riddick no. keeps progressing the way he is, you need him to be good enough. And I think that both Leonard and Mrazek could do that and would probably get the starter job. I mean, they're probably coming in to be the starter, so you're not going to have that same issue. But I think either one, you sign them to two, three years, and they really become the stopgap while we wait for Parsons. For me, like with players that are a bit of a head case, unless they're a top tier talent like a Patrick Kane, usually it's not worth it just for how they disrupt chemistry. Like if you look at Riddick, he's a okay goalie, better than an average for a backup, but he's well loved by the players because he's nuts and funny and that you need positive attitudes especially from your goalies and because unless they're like a patrick waugh or martin Brodeur, like you can handle those guys being jerks but you know if they're not (laughs) of that caliber you're not it's just not a good idea yeah okay i can see that um i mean you know, I'm looking again. I don't think Rene Bobrovsky or Varlamov are worth playing for. I think they're all going to de- demand a lot. I think the best goalies outside of them are Howard and Talbot. I'd be okay to bring Talbot in. Um, otherwise, I think Kincaid is the next best guy, but I think he's going to stay in New Jersey. They'll pay him to stay. I mean, he's making 1.25. He'll stay there. And then we get into guys like Peter Budai, Thatcher Demko, guys that really, to me, are no upgrade over Gillies or Riddick. Yeah, exactly. Uh, frankly, I think that the Flames are probably destined for the trade market again, as much as it's annoying that we keep trading for goalies. Well, but it, And I honestly think, and you were mentioning earlier with Schneider, there's always a team that sort of loses faith in somebody, you know, early in the year. And I'm not saying uh, Nashville's going to do that with Rene, but he hasn't looked great. Saros has looked good. Like, there's always one team that sort of loses faith in their starter. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames could scoop somebody up for cheap, but we'd probably have to wait till December to do that. Yeah, like, uh, say a Smith for Rene trade i think would you know we'd add probably a little something to that but i think that would make sense for nashville because then they could have soros being the number one for the rest of the year with smith 
being the backup potentially if that was to happen. I I I don't know though. I think that frankly I think we're kind of in that wait and see cuz the fact that you have Gillies and Parsons and Riddick all playing you're you have to wait and see what the young guys do and like Riddick is doing well enough as the backup that maybe he needs a few more starts whether the Stockton guys push and look like they're going to be NHL caliber right now well, like, and, we and just I don't, don't have that, quite a I think if we have bad goaltending the answer is not to go to the farm at this point true and I think we're kind of in that wait and see pattern uh, for all of our goalies frankly right now but I think long term like honestly the guy I'd target probably the hardest both because it would be hilarious and because it would make the actual most sense would be Cam Talbot but and the Flames did try to get him when he ended up signing with Edmonton so here, here's yeah. here's a kind of crazy idea for you. So I'm looking at goalies who might be available now or let's say in the next 60, 90 days. Um, in Carolina right now, Mrazek is playing and McElhaney is his backup. Scott Darling is hurt. I'm a big Scott Darling fan. I could see him being the odd man out to McElhaney. What do you think if, I mean, if the Flames need some help of moving Smith for Dar, I, I mean, move Smith out for something and bring Darling in in a separate trade because Carolina doesn't need a goalie, but essentially replacing Smith for Darling. That'd be fine. I, Darling's a weird goalie. and I don't think Darling uh, is necessarily the guy who plays 60 games, but I think he's if he's got a hot Riddick as his backup, I think he'll be fine. Yeah, I yeah. If Darling plays well, then that's one thing. But he's very inconsistent, and like when he was with Chicago, he's very good. But like he since he's been with Carolina, he's behind a great team too. Yeah, and since he's been with Carolina, like he's had a lot more pressure put on him, much like Riddick was last year when he became the starter all of a sudden, and he kind of just didn't really know how to handle that yeah i could see it working but i'm just i'm just looking at guys who it would depend on the acquisition cost but it, it could be feasible yeah, i'm i'm looking at guys who might be available yeah th- it would make sense if like we weren't giving up a ton because there are like i think three years left on that contract all right here's another crazy idea send smitty back to the desert and bring in ranta well, I I actually wanted Ranta before uh, the Flames acquired Smith. That's the guy I was actually kind of hoping. One of you remember at the time when we were looking at goalies who were unprotected in the expansion draft, I'd suggested a Ranta Darling as our one too. Yeah, and uh, I think we were both in agreement there. And, and the fact that the he's price playing, that Ranta got sold for, I I would have paid that price. Oh yeah, and Ranta's played very well. Um, Again, I'm not not sure if you're wanting to pay that price tag to get a guy who's playing that well, but it depends on what Arizona is actually looking for. Like if it, say it was say Shillington for Ranta, I'd be fine with that. But like so Shillington and Smith, what do those say? Brody plus. I think in that case you got to have a goalie not for this year, but you're you're bringing in a guy long term if you're giving up Brody. Yeah, and that'd be fine depending on what the rest of the deal is like if mm-hmm. it's say brody for one of their defensemen and ranta i'd be okay with that i never thought of schneider but that's an interesting way to go i think it, where they are in their career schneider and smitty are probably at about the same spot and yeah schneider's schneider's younger so that might be a way to go too yeah and new jersey like with kincaid like they don't really need a high quality backup uh, like if you would in, obviously include Smith in the trade, but I think that it, you could get away with just sending like other secondary things that the the Devils need. Because the, the, after Ryan Miller, oh God, no! Horrible goalie. Couldn't stand him even when he was with Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, I think in my mind Schneider to me is still a Canuck and. 
I think I sort of have a bit of a hate on for him because of that. I still remember him as a Canuck, but yeah, might be a decent, might be a decent guy to go after. Well, you got to figure that New Jersey would like to shed his cap hit, so. Yeah, well, and they're going to need money for Kincaid, so I could see definitely dump him, spend that money on Kincaid. Yeah, because I think find... that you know the Flames wouldn't have to spend a ton in terms of assets because of the nature of that contract to get him. It's just getting all the details to work. Yeah, and, and looking here, it's interesting. Um, if we take a look, it looks like Philadelphia is going to lose both their goalies. Edmonton's going to lose both their goalies. So, you know, even if next year we were to see New Jersey go with like a Kincaid Montoya or Kincaid Budai, where you spend all your money on one guy and nothing on the other guy, I could definitely see them doing that too. Yeah, and I think that the, the Devils would be perfectly fine if they had just like an adequate backup like uh, just Chad johnson will be available yeah like just insert random filler backup you know like the jamie mclennan of this era whomever that Actually, is i and i could see them doing what we said earlier and grab your younger guy in your kincaid and go grab like a cam ward yeah that would make a lot of sense so maybe that's an option the flames go with if they find they need goaltending well, Matt, we've come to the part of the show where it's time for predictions. And if we look back at last week, I actually won the week with exactly the right uh, prediction. I predicted we win Boston, New York, lose to Nashville. And your prediction was winning in Nashville and New York and losing to Boston. Yeah. Two weeks in a row where one of us is exactly right. What's going on? We had that, what, like once the whole season last year? Yeah, I know. Uh, bizarre. I thought we're going to be wrong every week after this now. Oh, yeah, probably are. Like, our rights are out of our system. Yeah, we, you know, we're having our Zach Ronaldo moment where, you know, just having the amazing goal right off the bat and then nothing the rest of the way. We're getting predictions right now, and I think we're done. There you go. That's our one for the season. Well, we've got a couple interesting games coming up. Uh, we got th- Let's do four games in this prediction. We've got Montreal tomorrow night. The Flames are in Montreal. Then they come back for two more home games. They've got Pittsburgh and Washington at home. And then the 29th, they've got Toronto. So uh, four games there. What do you think? I think they win against Montreal, Pittsburgh, and Washington and lose to Toronto. Really? Yeah. Why do you think Toronto is the one team they lose to? I think that'll be like a 7-6 shoot 'em up type game. Wow. Yeah. I I think that, you know, they're the only offense that I think is like clearly above everybody else's. But, yeah, that one I'm concerned about just for their offensive talent more than anything. Because they're, they're horrible defensively. And so I think that that game has a high potential to be a big, like, 10-plus goals between the two teams type game. I think that, that Toronto game could easily be the last team to score is the winner. Yeah. Or it'll be a one nothing game just because. <laughs> so my predictions, I'm going to say we're going to beat Montreal and beat Washington. I think we're going to lose to Pittsburgh and Toronto, I think. Um, Pittsburgh, the Flames did you struggle with, and I think uh, that actually looking... the last couple of years, uh, the Flames have swept the season against them. The last two years, they've swept the season, but they've never really handedly beat them. I was looking back; they always seem to struggle in that game and somehow eke out a win. Yeah, well, that's the um, kind so... of thing I'm expecting. If they do win, it would be like an overtime or a shootout type win. Yeah, we'll see. I think I also think, and I hate to say it, I was originally going to go just Montreal for a win. I think the Flames are due for some losses here, knock on wood. Um, but just, you know, the hockey gods have to straighten this thing out for the Flames start at some point. Well, you know, it, we have to remain positive because, hey, they're actually winning games. We might actually be right if we continue predicting that they win. <laughs> How long until you, you, last year you were historic for doing the winning sweep. One of these weeks you're just going to give us, they're going to sweep the week. Yeah. Well, it won't be this one, but you know, soon. After that, we have Buffalo, Colorado, Chicago. Maybe that's your winning sweep. And we're going to lose them all. No. (laughs) I hope not. No. And then later, later in November, we have Montreal, Edmonton, Vegas. Maybe that'll be your sweep week. Yeah. Well, they better win at least two of those, but... (laughs) 
Yeah. Oh, even Vegas isn't doing so well right now. Uh, yeah. Well, that was the team I was thinking oh. of with the win. I think they're going to lose against Edmonton just because that seems to be our style. Uh, I think this is the year we can turn that around. Yeah, just sick Kachuk on McDavid and, you know, then have everybody else do. You know, I think if we if we can get our two... I don't even know if you need to do that. I think if we can get our two defensive lines rolling, line two and four, I think it'll be easy to shut down the one line Edmonton has yeah. and put one and three on the ice against whoever the hell else. It's a home game, so we get last change. Yeah. I, I think if they if they can get things clicking by then, it won't be that hard. True. And even I mean, if... Are we worried even if about Mc... Darnell Nurse and Chris Russell? I know. Well, if McDavid, you know, if you can keep him to like one or two goals, then you you win the game. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's it for this week, Matt. Um, enjoy these four games and the back and the Montreal game is it's always fun to watch an original six team. But enjoy these three games and the two at home, and we will talk to you at, for our next show next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.